Hi everybody, I am going to talk about the non-governmental organization management in the field of disability. NGO, the abbreviation for non-governmental organization, is a global phenomenon widely recognized and functional in the history of human society. NGOs are by and large involved in all sectors of social life. They prove to be more effective, efficient, innovative and responsive to problems affecting people at the grassroots level. They succeed in reaching out to the most unreached people across the globe. There are millions of people who are marginalized, vulnerable, disadvantaged and deprived of inclusion in the mainstream society and persons with disability are among such excluded population. They have many unmet needs, issues and challenges in the developing countries including India. NGOs are playing a vital role in promoting inclusive development among persons with disability. In this backdrop, it is pertinent to know the management of NGOs in dealing with the concerns of the people with a disability. At the end of this talk, you will understand the meaning and the special features of NGOs. Gain an adequate knowledge about the laws related to NGOs and learn the steps in project management and financial management. Let me describe the meaning and features of non-governmental organizations. A non-governmental organization is a non-profit voluntary citizens group which is organized on a local, national or international level. The concept of non-governmental organization or NGO came into use in 1945 following the establishment of the United Nations Organization which recognized the need to give a consultative role to organizations which were neither government nor member states. NGOs take different forms and play different roles in different countries. According to Turner and Hulm, NGOs are generally registered organizations, community groups, professional associations, trade unions, cooperative charity organizations whose aim is to improve the well-being of their members and of those areas in which they exist. The World Bank, on the other hand, sees NGOs as private organizations that pursue activities to relieve the sufferings of human persons, promote the interests of the poor, protect the environment, provide basic social services, and undertake community development. Although there is some difference of opinion about the definition of an NGO, it is widely accepted that NGOs perform a variety of service and humanitarian functions, bring citizens' concerns to governments, promote interests of the poor, protect the environment, undertake community development, advocate and monitor policies and encourage political participation through provision of information. They provide analysis and expertise, serve as early warning mechanisms and help monitor and implement international agreements. There are certain fundamental features which distinguish the NGOs from other organizations. For an organization to be recognized as not-for-profit, it should satisfy certain criteria. 1. An NGO should be privately set up and sufficiently autonomous in its activity that is independent of direct governmental control. 2. An NGO should also be non-profit which would clearly define its voluntary character. Three. It cannot be considered as a political party with an aim of attaining political power and for an NGO should support development which demonstrates its character of public interest. 
In India, non-profit or public charitable organizations can be registered as trusts, societies or as a private limited non-profit company under respective laws provided by the government. Non-profit organizations in India exist independently of the state are self-governed by a board of trustees or managing committee or governing council comprising individuals who generally serve in a fiduciary capacity produce benefits for others generally outside the membership of the organization and are non-profit making in as much as they are prohibited from distributing monetary residual to their own members. Section 2 of the Income Tax Act, which is applicable uniformly throughout the Republic of India, defines charitable purpose to include relief of the poor, education, medical relief, and the advancement of any other object of general public utility. A purpose that relates exclusively to religious teaching or worship is not considered as charitable. Thus, in ascertaining whether a purpose is public or private, one has to see if the class to be benefited or from which the beneficiaries are to be selected constitute a substantial body of the public. A public charitable purpose has to benefit a sufficiently large section of the public as distinguished from specified individuals. Organizations which lack the public element such as trusts for the benefit of workmen or employees of a company have not been held to be charitable. As long as the beneficiaries of the organization comprise an uncertain and fluctuating body of the public answering a particular description, the fact that the beneficiaries may belong to a certain religious faith or a sect of persons of a certain religious persuasion would not affect the organization's public character. Whether a trust, society or section 8 company, the Income Tax Act gives all categories equal treatment in terms of exempting their income and granting ATG certificate whereby donors to non-profit organizations may claim a rebate against donations made. Foreign contributions to non-profit organizations are governed by FCRA regulations under Home Ministry. Let me mention about the additional license needed for the NGOs working in the field of disability. A non-governmental organization which desires to work in the field of disability needs to obtain additional license from the concerned authorities as directed under respective acts. In order to become a tax-exempt organization, a non-governmental organization needs to register under Section 12A of the Income Tax Act 1961. This registration needs to be done within one year from the date of the registration of the trust or society or company. The Commissioner of Income Tax concerned with the area of operation of the organization's projects needs to be contacted. This is one time process the life of an NGO. Organizations which aim at raising donations from the general public for fulfilling its objectives may obtain registration under Section 80G of the Income Tax Act. This registration can be done any time after obtaining 12A registration. By registering under Section 80G, an NGO can issue certificate to a donor for making donation and the donor receives 50% exemption from his or her taxable income. An organization which aims at working for the welfare of the persons with a disability need to obtain special license from government authorities after complying with the norms and standards prescribed in the Persons with Disabilities Act 1995 and the National Trust Act 1999. Let me discuss about the management of NGO. 
according to Harold Kuhn's management is an art of getting things done through and with the people in formally organized groups it is an art of creating an environment in which people can perform and individuals can cooperate towards the attainment of group goals Taylor defines management as an art of knowing what to do, when to do, and see that it is done in the best and cheapest way. Management is a purposive activity. It is something that directs group efforts towards the attainment of certain predetermined goals. It is a process of working with and through others to effectively achieve the goals of the organization by efficiently using limited resources in the changing world. Luther Gallick has given a key word POSD-CORB as important components of management where P stands for planning, O for organizing, S for staffing, D for directing, CO for coordination, R for reporting, and B for budgeting. Let me tell you about the participatory program planning in the management of NGOs. Participatory planning is a process by which a community undertakes to reach a given socio-economic goal by consciously assessing its problems and charting a course of action to resolve those problems. The experts are needed but only as facilitators. Moreover, no one likes to participate in something which is not of his or her own creation. Plans prepared by outside experts, irrespective of their technical soundness, cannot inspire the people to participate in their implementation. Let me outline the steps in initiating participatory planning which is very relevant in the field of disability. Step 1. Identify local needs, particularly of the persons with a disability. The best way to find what people need and what they see as possible solutions to their problems is to ask them directly. This also creates awareness and willingness among the people to take part in any action that will follow. But before asking what they want, it is necessary to establish a common ground of understanding with them. There are bound to be conflicting interests within a community. Special skills and sincerity are needed to build consensus. Local officials, field workers of voluntary organizations, teachers, women and retired people must be involved in the consultations and discussions. Step 2. Collect basic data. Once local contacts are established, the next step is to collect with the people's help basic data about the community, characteristics of the area, resources situation, socio-economic status and other relevant facts. The aim is to get a factual baseline picture which will help in setting goals and measuring changes brought about by the project at a later stage. To seek people's cooperation, it is important to respect their ideas and abilities. The focus should be on the community as a whole and seeking its commitment to helping the poor. Participatory rural appraisal is a practical tool for participatory data collection and analysis. Step 3. Formation of working groups. It is helpful to form working groups that include local officials to prepare status reports and develop perspectives. The aim of the working group is to analyze and compare data, draw inferences and identify priority areas for intervention. This is aimed at a greater clarity and strengthening of participation of local people, particularly the rural poor, 
by giving greater local planning responsibility and establishment of good working relationship between technical planning experts and the local people. Importance is to be given to detailed specification of the roles of participant individuals, groups and committees in carrying out the tasks. Conflicts and disagreements may arise in the process which are not in themselves a negative factor but have to be properly resolved and managed at every stage of decision making. Step 4. Formulation of the objectives. The first step in participatory local planning is to define precisely what specific objectives are to be achieved, which should be stated in concrete terms. The objective may not always be quantifiable particularly when it involves attitudinal changes. It still helps to be as specific as possible so that people can see how much change has taken place. Step 5. Deciding the strategy. This is the most difficult part of the participatory local planning as it involves assessing and mobilizing needed resources and choosing the planning methods. It is important to specify the locally available resources and those needed from outside. Once a course of action is chosen, it should be explained and specified in clear terms to avoid confusion and misunderstanding among the local stakeholders. Step 6. Ensuring feasibility. The working groups at this point should consider whether the objectives are realistic. It is important to ensure that assumptions and stipulations regarding the availability of resources, managerial competence and technical expertise are realistic. It is important to identify potential project beneficiaries and check how the benefits would flow to them. Step 7. Preparing the work plan. This is a blueprint for decentralized project management drawn up by the project implementation committee specifying the what, who, when and how of local project implementation. The work plan should contain information such as all activities for implementation of the project, names of the persons responsible for each activity, time frame of the project and the means to carry out the activities. It should also define the outputs expected from each activity to measure performance during implementation or on completion of the project for effective monitoring and evaluation. Step 8. Preparing the budget. The material and human resources must be given a monetary cost which form the project budget. The cost is further broken down in terms of each period of time and also in terms of availability, whether locally available or to be secured from outside. The external resources can be government grants or loans from financial institutions and so on. Step 9. Implementation of development projects with a particular reference to the disabled people. This step consists of these tasks. 1. Appointing a project coordinator. After hiring staff and technical persons for different jobs according to the schedule, the organization or the agency in charge of the project should appoint a coordinator for the project. The coordinator can be hired from outside or someone from within the community with a commitment and a demonstrated leadership qualities can be chosen for the job. 2. Setting up a project implementation and monitoring committee. This is made up of the project coordinator, representatives of the local community and a representative of the funding agency. Its role is to supervise implementation on a day-to-day -day basis and to work as a crisis management group. 3. Staff training. This is needed to reorient project planning staff for the jobs to be performed. 4. Transparency. 
This is very important for retaining community interest and support for the project to ensure its smooth progress. Maintaining total transparency in procurement and use of resources is very important. Project details, budget and sources of funds can be displayed publicly at the different places in the project area. Involving more and more local people in various activities with the daily or weekly briefings to inform community leaders about the ongoing activities and problems is more important in ensuring transparency. Care is needed to ensure the quality of inputs procured and used. 5. Anticipating obstacles. The project coordinator should be aware of likely difficulties. Be able to anticipate obstacles and take preventive action. Advanced action is needed to ensure timely availability of workers, especially technical people. Plans should be ready to deal with any contingency. 6. Timely release of funds. Implementation is often delayed by the non-availability or inadequacy of funds. Various bureaucratic formalities, postal delay and so on, may delay the commencement of the project. If there is more than one source of funding, it is all the more necessary to ensure that no mistake is made in completing formalities of terms and conditions documents and also in submitting timely progress reports which are needed for timely release of fund installments. The project coordinator should ensure that there are enough funds for activities as well as for paying project staff salaries. It is important to be prepared for delays by having flexibility in project design for such eventualities. Sticking to the guidelines and instructions of funding agencies and adherence to the project schedule are the best way to ensure timely release of fund installments. 7. Monitoring. This is important for timely and proper project implementation. Monitoring provides feedback so that necessary adjustments can be made in the work plan and budget. Therefore, monitoring schedules are often based on the project work plan. It is essentially a tool that helps both project implementing and funding agencies. Some of the important indicators or monitoring is time schedule, cost and process. These are already specified in the work plan. Monitoring reports must be reviewed by the project implementation committee focusing on information about delays, the extent and implications needed corrective action and the person or agency responsible for it. This not only points out the source of the fault but also protects project management from blame for the delay. An honest assessment of the implications of delay under or over utilization of funds leads to timely corrective action. It also helps in building a reasonable case for additional funds in case the delay is caused by the late release of funds and results in escalation of project costs. 8. Accountability and Integrity It is important for the implementing agency to maintain a high level of financial credibility which is closely watched by funding agencies. Monitoring therefore focuses on cost flows and wherever there is under or over expenditure this should be brought to the immediate attention of the funding agencies. It should be discussed frankly with them in order to reach agreement on the best course of action. Implications of delay or cost overrun can also be discussed with the village community to explore possibilities of mobilizing local contributions to compensate for the extra cost. Integrity pays in the long run. Let me describe the financial management of an NGO. All organizations need money. 
Besides staff, money is a very important component that the organization needs to develop and it takes much of its time in mobilizing and managing the resources. Good financial management depends on keeping records, internal control, budgeting and financial reporting. Let me sum up. Non-governmental organization, shortly known as NGO, is a global phenomenon widely recognized and functional in the history of human society. They are playing a vital role in promoting inclusive development among persons with disabilities. NGOs are seen as private organizations that pursue activities to relieve the sufferings of human persons, promote the interests of the poor, protect the environment, provide basic social services, and undertake community development. In India, non-profit or public charitable organizations can be registered as trusts, societies, or as a private limited non-profit company under respective laws provided by the government. An organization which aims at working for the welfare of the persons with disability need to obtain special license from government authorities after complying with the norms and standards prescribed in the Persons with Disabilities Act 1995 and the National Trust Act 1999. Management of NGO is a purposive activity. It is something that directs group efforts towards the attainment of certain predetermined goals. Participatory planning is a process by which a community undertakes to reach a given socio-economic goal by consciously assessing its problems and charting a course of action to resolve those problems. Good financial management depends on keeping records, internal control, budgeting and financial reporting. Let me sign off now and hope to see you in another session. Thank you.